Okay, everybody, um, welcome to the Interdisciplinary Lecture Series at the Center for Western Studies. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Emily Godrich. I'm the chair of the center, and it's my great pleasure to be here to introduce my friend and colleague, Orrit Goshkin. Orrit is a professor of Eastern Languages and Civilizations at the prestigious University of Chicago. She received her PhD in Near Eastern Studies from Princeton University in 2005, and has been teaching at Chicago ever since. She's a past fellow of the National Forum on the Future of Liberal Education, as well as the Frank Institute of Chicago, and a recipient of the Provost's Teaching Award. Orit's research interests include Arab intellectual history, modern Iraqi history, and the history of Arab Jews in Iraq and Israel, and she has published extensively on these topics. She's the author of The Other Iraq, Pluralism and Culture in Hashemite Iraq, which explored the vibrant cultural milieu of Iraq in the 1920s through the 1950s, and more recently, New Babylonians, a history of Jews in modern Iraq, which documents the lives of Iraqi Jews who internalize narratives of Arab and Iraqi nationalisms. And I especially recommend that second book. It's quite fascinating. Um, both of these books were published by Stanford University Press. Uh, we're honored that Orin is here today to share her research on the circumstances of Iraqi Jews who arrived in Israel in the 1950s. Please join me in welcoming Professor Orin Pashkin to the scene. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, as I'm, I'm giving this, the, as I start giving this talk, I see all these familiar faces here. And so thank you really uh, for coming here. It's, it's a great pleasure and a great honor. So in 1951, an Israeli medical doctor wrote a letter to Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion in protest of the living condition of Jewish children from Arab lands who arrived uh, with their parents to Israel uh, as migrants. Uh, the doctor reported that children, even newly born, were sick and there were not enough antibiotics to cure them. Hospital rejected children or poor children that didn't, and didn't provide services uh, to them. Uh, in certain locations where children live, children suffer from lice uh, or bites caused by insects. Malnutrition was not a rarity. The doctor described the case of a child who suffered from typhoid and was uh, hospitalized. After he recovered, however, the authorities refused to give his parents additional uh, food stamps uh, necessary for his recovery. How can you deny soup from a sick child, he asked. He concluded about the children's parents. Here they are and they should be accepted. The name Blacks, Schwarzes, does not fit them. We're not American Yankees, and they're not Negroes. Moreover, do we really accept and support how the Americans treat the Negroes? The situation, he concluded, it did, will have long-term effects. This was a case of, quote, historical injustice. The doctor who wrote the, language, the letter didn't know much about the lives of uh, Jews from Middle Eastern uh, countries, but he identified a few important uh, phenomena, such as the categorization of Middle Eastern uh, Jews as black Jews, or in Yiddish, uh, Schwarzes. Um, and um, also, uh, he emphasized that they were victimized uh, and neglected by the state. Many complaints uh, like this about the horrendous situation uh, in which uh, migrants to Israel, uh, both uh, Mizrahi and Ashkenazis. Uh, so complaints like that were written uh, in the 1950s, mostly by nurses, sanitary workers, doctors, social workers. But these grievances unfortunately fell on deaf ears. Now, Iraqi Jews, the group that I uh, study, were amongst these migrants uh, who came to Israel. A community of 120,000 uh, Jews was displaced um, as a result of the Arab-Israeli conflict. The Iraqi state labeled many Jews, as, or almost all Jews, as Zionist traitors. Israel pushed very hard to get the Jews in. Um, and as a result, this community arrived to Israel in uh, large numbers, um, around 180,000, 80,000 uh, of which in the years 50, uh, 51. Um, now, in thinking about uh, the community of Iraqi Jews, again, I'm not studying the entire wave of migration to Israel in the 50s, but only the Iraqi, uh, the Iraqi migrants. Um, and in thinking about them, I came uh, up with the concept of thinking about them as migrant uh, citizens. On the one hand, uh, they were citizens. Upon their arrival, they were given the right to vote, the right to participate in the state uh, labor unions, the right uh, to register their children to school, 
Poles. But on the other hand, there were also migrants. Because they came from Iraq and because they were perceived by the state as kind of bringing with them the primitive culture uh, of their nation state, uh, the state perceived them as people who did not deserve rights as other citizens and uh, as people who should be thankful for uh, the little they got. Now, most Iraqi Jews lived in uh, what was called Ma'abarot, uh, Ma'abir in Arabic, or transit camps. Um, if you looked at the map of Israel in the 1950s, almost it, next to almost every city was um, a neighborhood or a, a, a certain locale that was filled with uh, tents and wooden shacks and houses made of tin. Uh, these were called transit camps. And the idea behind settling uh, Jews there was that they would live there. They would find a lively, they would find some kind of livelihood in the city next door or in the village uh, next door. They will be able to support their family, so they will not live in uh, camps at the expense of the state. Um, and gradually, they would move uh, from the transit camps to more. Uh, um, secure or to better uh, settlements. The problem was that Iraqi Jews, as well as many other uh, Jewish communities, remained stuck in these camps uh, for almost uh, a decade. To zoom in uh, on the faith of Iraqi Jews, I want to focus on three camps uh, in particular, uh, Saqiyah or Saqiyah, Khairiyah, and Kfarana. Um, all of these were uh, Palestinian villages uh, that were depopulated in 1948 when Jaffa uh, was conquered in April. Um, and on the ruins of these camps, uh, the state first brought, uh, on the ruins of these villages, the state first settled uh, Jews from Turkey and Libya, but later on uh, it built in each such location, in Khairiya, Saki, and Kfarana, two huge uh, transit camps, um, and the number of people uh, living in uh, each such camp rank between uh, 3,000 uh, to 2,000 uh, in each camps, and, and most of them were Jews uh, from uh, Iraq. Now, there's been a lot of literature about uh, Jews from uh, Middle Eastern countries in Israel known as Mizrahim. Um, I, for me, the term that uh, is most fitting to sort of think about the state relationship with, uh, with the Mizrahim is social engineering. Uh, the state wanted to educate them, westernize them, discipline them. Um, and of course, here there are important connections to the Arab-Israeli conflict. It's worthwhile mentioning that a lot of people who were involved in the managing of the um, migrants' life, be it uh, Levi Eshkol, who came up with the idea of uh, the transit camp, uh, Pinchas Levon, who headed the Easter route, and especially the diva of labor Zionism, Golda Meir, who at the time was uh, the uh, labor minister, uh, later on had uh, very significant roles in uh, Israeli history. The most kind of uh, uh, important uh, uh, attestation of the fact that uh, the Iraqis, as well as other migrants, were considered um, something that the state needed to mold was the expression with which they were used, uh, human material, or in Hebrew, chomer um, enoshi. And we find expressions like bad human material, problematic human material, um, and in worst cases, human dust, an expression that was usually used uh, by even by Israel's uh, first prime minister to refer to uh, Holocaust survivors. Um, so uh, the thinking about this kind of failed project of social engineering is something that uh, is important to me. There were a lot of statements about how this project is going to be run, but unfortunately the social engineers themselves were quite inept. So it's a project of social engineering that doesn't really work. A second thing that is important to me is the idea of resistance. Uh, in the literature of resistance of Jews from uh, the Middle East um, uh, to state policies, there's a lot of emphasis on what's happening in the 60s, 70s, uh, 80s. So uh, the Mizrahi Black Panthers, uh, political organization, mostly resistance of men to the state. I'm more interested in the migrants themselves, uh, in their demonstration, in their protests, in the ways in which mothers try to raise children under these conditions, in how men try to uh, support their families. And to me, success in this domain, when all the, the chances are against you, is as important as sort of the resistance of uh, uh, the more politicized group that will come in um, 
uh, in the coming uh, decades. And what I want to do right now is take you to uh, sort of the structure of these camps, then the people who are living there, uh, there and then their political actions. Um, and so Kharia, uh, Sakia, and uh, Kfar Ana were populated very uh, quickly. Um, and what's interesting is that you hear the name of the Palestinian villages. And that was true for many of these transit camps that were named after the Palestinian villages that were depopulated. Zarnuga, Kubeba, Shubaki, Jalil, uh, and other places. The land itself was a, the agricultural land that belonged to these uh, villages, which was the important thing, was annexed already by kibbutzim, mushavim, uh, more, more established communities in Israel. The remains uh, the, the sort of the, the inner of the village became the transit camp. But again, they were built very quickly and uh, the most and people suffered because of this kind of hasty construction of tents. Um, and the most unfortunate were the people of Khairia, a transit camp that was located next to one of Israel's uh, largest landfill or, or uh, dung hill uh, or Mizbala or Mazbala uh, in Arabic. Um, Animals were attracted to the garbage, the uh, rotting of organic materials endangered the, cam the camp's uh, health. Uh, people could smell the garbage, it was too close to the schools. And we have complaints by doctors, by health specialists, sort of saying this is an ecological disaster. Uh, but you also have something that is very typical to the life of the Iraqi migrants in which uh, nobody wants to take responsibility. Uh, the mayor of Tel Aviv said, well, we used to use this place before, so we're not to blame that the Jewish agency, the body in charge of bringing the, the newcomers, dumped them there. This is not our responsibility. The minister of health said, um, uh, yes, this is very uh, sad, but actually it's the fault of Tel Aviv, which is indicative to this kind of bureaucratic maze uh, that included bodies from the pre-state era, bodies uh, of the Zionist organizations, state uh, government that were all in charge of uh, dealing uh, with the newcomers. Now, in the camps themselves, um, housing was uh, divided into people who first lived in tents, then uh, in houses made of uh, stronger cloth or uh, tin, and the lucky ones that were able to uh, pay down payment lived in uh, wooden shacks. And there was a whole politics within the camps regarding who would get to live in um, a wooden shack. Um, so uh, sometimes it, it uh, drove people apart because everybody wanted to live in such a shack. But on the other hand, uh, people also helped each other uh, to squat into different places. And so if there was a rumor about um, a wooden shack that was emptied, somebody else would say to other families, go ahead and squat it uh, before uh, other people uh, would enter. Um, the Jewish agency uh, tried to punish uh, these uh, invaders. Now, generally, these, uh, these uh, houses, the tents and the houses made of tin in particular, were extremely dangerous. There were uh, many cases of candles or portable stoves that, that caught uh, fire. Showers and toilets uh, were public and located outside of the tents and the shacks, and they were few in uh, number. So five or six showers servicing hundreds uh, of people. Um, and uh, for women, that was extremely painful because especially women from Arab countries were not used to this kind of institution of public shower. And that seemed uh, shaming to them. Uh, they, they were afraid of men peeping. Some women were afraid of uh, their children being attacked. And so you, you read about women carrying water to wash their children next to the, the tents. Uh, Saqiya, one of these uh, villages, also suffered from uh, very bad quality uh, of water. The water was brown, and uh, the people of the camp used to call it uh, Coca-Cola. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, the Ministry of Health said that although the water uh, were brown, they were, uh, no, they, they didn't recognize the color, but they said although the water tasted badly, they were drinkable. Um, and so uh, people were stuck with uh, the situation of the water. The roads that connected the transit camps uh, to the cities and the towns were also poor and the transportation was inadequate, which meant that men who worked outside of the camps had to uh, wake up really early uh, to work, uh, to get the buses uh, to the city, to walk quite a long time uh, to get to the buses. 
But the most tragic situation had to do with women uh, giving birth because the ambulances uh, didn't uh, show up uh, on time and babies uh, died. And so there was a case in, Sa in Saqiya where an ambulance was called at six o'clock. The baby was born an, at eight o'clock, still waiting for the ambulance, died in the camp after eight o'clock. And the mother was finally hospitalized, severely ill when the ambulance finally arrived. Now, initially, because of the situation, mothers were encouraged to give birth at home and were given special uh, compensation for uh, delivering uh, at home. And nurses themselves feared uh, the long ride uh, to the hospital, often in trucks. So it was encouraged to give birth at home. Women were, again, also afraid of their privacy. What happens if they give uh, birth in a public place? Um, but in 1954, the policy was changed and mother uh, received grants for delivering babies in the hospital. Uh, now, these conditions were seen by the state as the fault of the migrants. And here lies the, the, the sort of first uh, tragedy. They were not thought about as middle class Jews made poor by the experience of uh, immigration. Um, they were thought about as uh, the result of the migrants being uh, dirty, unhygienic in the lands in which uh, they came from. And it was also perceived as kind of a necessary suffering. People had to suffer because this is a necessary part in the process of becoming a citizen. So here is Golda Meir uh, giving a speech on the conditions in these three transit camps. Despite of my awareness of the sufferings of people who dwell in the tents and the inequality between those who dwell in houses and those who dwell in tents, still, if I have to choose between stopping immigration until we can settle each and every one of them in the future or continuing with the immigration and that many thousands would dwell in the camps, I choose the latter. And I am certain that the newcomers would choose this with me. A tent in Khairiya is more important than a house in Iraq for the newcomers and for the state. And you see here how Meir sort of decides for herself what is better for the newcomers, what is uh, better for the state, and sort of collapses them together. Now, the people in the camp, uh, again, had to survive somehow. This was the plan. Um, and so most men worked in something that was called uh, avodat dachak, or a type of a work fair uh, that had the Iraqis engage in agricultural work, paving roads, clearing stones, uh, from, uh, the, uh, clearing stones from road. But later on, many of them found uh, um, uh, jobs in uh, factories close to Ramad Gan, the elite factories and, and other chocolate factory. Um, now, there has been in the literature quite a lot about the sort of humiliating aspect of the fact that middle class Jews were now asked to work in agriculture as a way of making them uh, socialist uh, Zionists. Uh, in my opinion, the, the problem was not only that. Uh, men were the, given uh, uh, assignment on a daily basis or a weekly basis. Uh, to work. If you were 55 and uh, older, you were not entitled to do it. And the state had, although socialists had a system where uh, they really felt that people were out to scam the system. Um, so they're very stingy with their benefits. Also, the state was broke at the time. Um, but uh, significantly, men who work 70 days a month uh, were considered working men and were not entitled uh, to benefits. Um, another important problem is that the legislation itself regulating labor, um, although there were some laws from the mandatory period, was legislated as the Iraqis themselves and other migrants were uh, employed. So the laws are, um, regulating teenager labor uh, were passed in 1952, uh, 1953 female labor, 1954 uh, another uh, important legislation regarding wages. They were employed since 1950. Um, and uh, this, of course, created tensions and also uh, hopes that people could somehow uh, support their family, families. 
as men declined, Iraqi women had to deal uh, with this uh, situation uh, and with problems uh, unique uh, to their gender. And many women, uh, actually as the men declined, kind of rose to the occasion. Uh, many also worked with histadrut uh, organizations of uh, working mothers. But the simplest of house chores uh, became uh, a challenge. Israel at the time was under severe uh, austerity measures uh, and food was granted uh, through using uh, food stamps or uh, food forms. Uh, there were paraffin cooking stoves or primus in uh, the tents and the shacks, but again, they were dangerous. Uh, because it was difficult to have refrigerators in uh, places where the connection to electricity was problematic at best, um, many people in the transit camps uh, got not uh, food portions, but um, actually powders, milk powders, other powders. It was almost a regime uh, of powders. Now, it's interesting uh, to know that the entire country was under these austerity measures, but people who had relatives in uh, agricultural communities, people who can afford uh, to buy things in the black market could actually overturn uh, these uh, severe legislations and buy meat and other products. Um, for people who lived in transit camps in poor neighborhoods, this was uh, much more um, uh, difficult. Now, again, the state perceived these women as in need of being educated and disciplined. They didn't think about you know, women who went to high schools and needed to leave uh, uh, any form of education in Israel to support their family. The idea was that mothers uh, were born this way. They were born poor. And so the state sent uh, nurses to guide mothers uh, how to raise their children. Um, and it was also a form to discipline the mothers. So for example, uh, this, uh, people used to get care packages which were packages donated by American Jews that included um, uh, sheets and clothes for, uh, for babies. So the nurses in the camps used to divide them up, give some to women, some to other women, the women who behaved, the women whose husband voted for uh, the right political parties, and uh, there was also the assumption that the women had to pay something. So they would learn that you don't get things uh, for free uh, from uh, the state. Um, young women also had to struggle, as I said, to get education. Um, there are interesting accounts about women who visited what was called uh, the Clinic for Psychological Hygiene. Um, they had creative names at the time uh, in Jaffa and Jerusalem about disturbed Iraqi women uh, that attested to the fact that young women that they uh, studied were suffering from depression manifested in, in crying, self-pity, suicidal thoughts. Um, and read even slightly against um, the very patronizing um, uh, sort of tone of these accounts, you see women that are suffering. They can't find jobs. The jobs that they find are unsatisfying. Uh, they see their fathers fall from grace. They had problems with uh, their fathers. And they're trying to find a place in uh, Israeli society. Uh, the most desperate women, uh, like men, turn uh, to criminality. We know about prostitutions in the camp. Bechor Shitri, the minister of police, depicted the women who ended up in jail as difficult human materials, prostitute, psychopaths, much wilder and more untamed than the male prisoners. Now, uh, one of the greatest challenge in this period was raising uh, children. Um, and I just want to share with you, this is actually more about European migrants than is about uh, Iraqi migrants, but just to show you the effects of uh, migration. My colleague, Ori, my colleague Orit Rosen, not Orit Bashkin, Orit Rosen, uh, provided the following statistics. Uh, in 1947, the infant mortality rate amongst the Jewish community was 29 babies for every thousand children. In 1949, when the waves begin to come from Europe and from some Arab countries, the number rose to 51.71 per thousand. The breakdown is important, however. In the kibbutzim, uh, in the agricultural communities, the establishment, the ratio was 16.5 uh, per thousand, whereas amongst the newcomers, it was 157 per thousand. And in 51 and 52, the, the numbers actually decreased, uh, but that's just about um, 
giving uh, birth. Now, it was difficult to uh, um, dress the babies, also to find uh, where to put them in tents and in shacks. Uh, people were usually give one or two uh, particular kinds of uh, beds, and, uh, and doctors report about children in boxes, cradle made of uh, baskets, sacks, uh, um, um, uh, uh, wooden boxes, um, and other uh, materials. Um, schools were also uh, a challenge, and the level of the school in the in the transit camps was not uh, good. Uh, people studied in wooden shacks in Saqiya. The maintenance of the school was difficult uh, for teacher. The school had no lightning. They were using uh, oil uh, lanterns. The school had no chairs. Children sat on the floor, um, and you see it in um, accounts of um, uh, the Istadrut, the state's uh, chief labor organization, um, where supervisors are sent to these uh, schools. And they write about the fact that it's cold in these shacks. So it's children are sitting uh, with their coats on, um, or the children are playing outside neglected. Nobody pays attention uh, to them. Uh, the state, however, uh, invested in youth organizations that were very successful in the transit camps, in Hebrew guides, in youth guides, and also uh, in the holidays. Um, in the Independence Day and also the Israeli holiday of Tu Bishvat, uh, which is the sort of holiday of trees. Um, and it was in a way very sinister because on that particular holiday, the children got a bag with fruits in it. And it was told that this was a gift from the committee who ran the transit camp. So the national holiday was connected uh, with something that the children um, needed, uh, which was food. Um, now, um, sometimes you also see that the children in the school are organizing in different ways. So in Khairia, for example, the students protested when the janitor was fired and didn't want to attend classes. Um, but um, what you do find in Khariya, Saki, and Kfarana is actually the Iraqi teachers themselves, and there was a very flourishing education system in Iraq, organizing together, using boxes and, and wooden materials as, as chairs and tables and trying to teach the children uh, themselves. Later on, the state actually uh, employed uh, uh, these teachers, also in Palestinian schools. Now, one of the phenomena that was, one of the phenomena that was important in this uh, period is illegal labor. People who are working uh, sort of um, uh, for black pay, um, so being hired not through the labor bureaus that assign the daily wages and the daily labor. And in this uh, situation, uh, children at high school age and even younger uh, were forced to work uh, and help their families. And we don't have statistics about how uh, widespread this phenomenon was. But in um, certain accounts, especially in accounts that I found uh, in the Arabic newspaper of the party Mapam um, Al Mirsad, uh, you do find attestations and you do find also discussions in Knesset committees. Uh, so here is a short story describing um, two children um, uh, in the, uh, from these camps working uh, for a man uh, digging hole. And the man is called Shaike. He hires them on a daily basis. If Master Shaike had two workers from the transit camp, it was a sign of great grace and incomparable goodness. He used to stand in front of his worker slaves, preaching to them about ethics, industriousness, loyalty, and spin, and didn't forget to mention to them at every moment that they're newcomers, that they're nothing more than poor dwellers of a transit camp, primitive, uneducated, and penniless. Um, now, in, um, there are many things to say about the children, but it's worthwhile to say that, again, in my opinion, in the years 1951, 1956, the greatest enemy of the state of Israel was not Jamal Abdel Nasser or radical Arabism or terrorism or all these kinds of things that were very important. Uh, it was actually the weather. Um, and especially in the year 4950, 50-51, uh, there were um, uh, snow fell in Israel, there were very difficult winters, and the tents uh, flew up in the air. Um, the state didn't want to evacuate the parents because uh, they were afraid that the parents would not come back, but children between the age of uh, 6 and uh, 12 were evacuated uh, from their houses in operations called Operation Rooftop um, that happened uh, in two uh, consecutive years. Now, some parents didn't want to give away their children. They were afraid that the children will not come back. 
So here's Esperance Korn, an Iraqi from uh, Khairia, who writes about the fact that two women come to her and say, give us the children. Um, and she answers, the children would die of hunger, but I will not give them to any other human being. I am their mother, um, and no one would take better care of them than me. After the polite women left, uh, disappointed from the primitive Iraqi woman who is willing to die with her children of hunger and did not give them to the hands of uh, civilized women who came, to the who came to rescue them from the darkness of the Middle Ages, I didn't even have a glass of milk to give them. I was not ashamed to uh, look in the garbage and I was happy to find an empty sardine box. And during, uh, later on in, in, in her narrative, she describes how she gets hot chocolate uh, for, their ch for her children. This story actually ended very well. One kid is today a NASA uh, um, engineer and the other is a very famous doctor. Uh, but um, most children, again, were evacuated. Uh, they were given, and, and this period of rain is a very interesting phenom phenomenon because on the one hand, you have kind of waves of volunteering. People taking in children, people um, are willing to help, people are going to the transit camp to help people with the tents. Uh, the army was involved, the IDF was involved, but you also see elements uh, of racism. Children sent back because they, uh, they didn't share the language of the host family. Uh, in fact, over 2,000 families uh, wanted to know the age, the uh, gender, and the community Ida, um, of the child before they were committed to taking him or her. Now, some of it had to do with genuine concerns. There was a sort of the global polio disease is uh, happening around that time. And some of it had to do with uh, racism. Uh, for example, um, there were uh, um, reports in uh, Kol Ha'am, um, which was the communist newspaper that described how the children from Khairia and Sakia were put in an old slaughterhouse in Ramat Gan, and later on the city people actually come, give them food, give them shelter, and then they're transferred uh, to, uh, to a school. Um, again, some of these, uh, some of, uh, these uh, moments are, of the rains are moments where you know, everything collapses. In Khairia, people uh, break into uh, the, the shortage, the, the food, uh, into food uh, where the food was stored and, and steal some things. In some camps, the directors fled away. Um, but this, again, was not perceived as the fault of, uh, of the state, but rather uh, of the newcomers. Here is uh, Yosef, uh, Georg Yosefthal of the Jewish Agency. The lack of care of the children is the most shocking thing in the whole situation. I do not say it only with respect to the Iraqis. You find that also with the Persians and the Kurds, but no way with the Yemenis. Um, uh, the origin of this indifference is fatalism. It is an apathy also expressed in the lack of organization and family and individual uh, life. Now, uh, this situation in the camps was met with resistance of the people of the camp. Uh, and, it was not and it was not easy to rebel because troublemakers had to pay heavy price for their actions. They were fired, denied work placement, and punished by the authority in the, in the transit camp. So not in these three camps, but in the north, uh, workers who refused to work in agricultural labor, including picking cotton, in protest of the low wages um, and the nature of the position were denied uh, welfare benefits by the labor ministry. So it's all uh, connected. Uh, but people find uh, ways to uh, revolt, especially in demonstrations in Tel Aviv, all throughout the 1950s. So uh, the people of Khairia uh, demanded work in front of uh, offices of uh, the labor bureaus in Bnei Brak, in Tel Aviv. Uh, the people of Saqia brought the Coca-Cola water um, and said, these are the water that we're drinking, demonstrating uh, with them because there were no phones and you couldn't report to uh, and call an ambulance as people protested that in front of the uh, um, post office ministry. So the people from Saqia traveled to uh, the post office ministry in King George Street in Tel Aviv demanding a phone after an old woman was put on a donkey uh, to be taken to the doctor and died on the way. Um, and at many times they were met uh, with uh, police violence. Other... Um, other protesters also went uh, all the way uh, to Jerusalem to protest in the Knesset. 
Uh, another form was petitions. We found dozens of them from Khairiya Sakya Farana and all over uh, the country. Now, these petitions are quite interesting because they include not only names of Iraqis, but also of other inhabitants of the, of the uh, transit camps. And you see there from um, uh, Sephardi names, Ashkenazi names, and you can actually imagine the situation where folks are going tent by tent, shack by shack, trying to make uh, people uh, sign these uh, petitions. I want to end with a small case of resistance that I think is important because it tells something about uh, the whole system. Uh, a man by the name of Igal or Naji Eliyahu uh, was a teacher in um, the schools in Khairiya Saki and Kfarana. Uh, and he was troubled, he was a leftist, he belonged again to a party called Matam, and he was troubled by the execution of Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. So, which was a phenomenon in Israel at the time, you had the poems written about the, the religious newspaper, had Sofe covered the case and the, how they were, you know, the couple was uh, um, marching, reading verses from the Psalms uh, as they were about to be electrocuted. Uh, it was a very important moment for the left critical of um, Mapai, the chief labor uh, um, Zionist party that, that controlled this whole operation and was in charge of, of many of its uh, faults and, and, and sort of Mapai was the, the party to be blamed in all this situation. So in any ways, uh, this guy, let's call him Naji, uh, and not Igal Eliyahu Naji, um, goes to the fellow teachers and he makes them sign the petition that protests the execution of uh, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg and he um, publishes in the communist newspaper called Kola Am. Then all, all hell breaks loose. The teachers all sign petitions saying that, or letters saying that uh, they didn't uh, uh, mean to do it. An investigation begins. People discover that, the, that Naji's brother is also, uh, belo uh, also belongs to Mapam and also uh, takes children uh, under the bridge to teach them uh, leftist, uh, dangerous uh, ideo uh, ideologies. Uh, later on, Eliyahu is called to uh, be investigated in uh, the Ministry of Education, uh, where, he, uh, where he says in his defense, you know, but also the Pope said that, uh, and, and Albert Einstein says that, you know, you shouldn't execute these guys, and he's, and he's being told uh, very cynically, yes, but uh, Albert Einstein and uh, the Pope um, did not publish their protests uh, in uh, the newspapers of the Israeli left. Now, um, all this investigation and, and this case that I, I give you just the highlights of show you sort of the, the degree of the state intervention that political actions could cause somebody uh, his or her job. Also, all the letters from the teachers, or most of them, are written in the same hand, uh, handwriting um, and the same formula, which means that somebody wrote the letters for them and also shows you that these teachers were petrified that they were going to lose uh, their jobs. And some even provide like very funny excuses later on. They said, well, we thought he was going to send it to Eisenhower, not publish it here uh, in Israel. But the pressure is important. And also the insistence of this guy, Naji, that kept saying, even as he was about to be fired, that he as a teacher has a right to teach children um, what he thinks is important. So what can we learn uh, from all of this? I think that we need to write a whole new history of Israel in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, not from the vantage point of the victorious state, but from those defeated, be that the Palestinians uh, or the mass waves of migrants that came to Israel, the Iraqis, the North Africans, uh, the Europeans, the Holocaust survivors. They each have their story, and this story uh, needs, uh, needs to be um, needs to be uh, told. Um, and I also think that, uh, you know, in, in kind of this situation, by focusing on the individual and not on the state, you produce a more, uh, you still produce a critique of the state, but you produce a more nuanced history uh, that respects people's suffering um, and kind of tries to undo their categorization uh, as uh, human material. Now, you know, when you finish, uh, a movie or something like that, there's always sort of a, a short notice, you know, black screen, white letters, what happened uh, next? So what happened to these uh, three uh, camps? Um, there were eventually in the late 1950s, um, 
and through a very long process that could actually be conceptualized as uh, lasting to the 1980s, um, uh, they were finally uh, dissolved. Um, the richer Jews or the Jews that had social capital that they could use, accountants, lawyers, moved to the more established city of Ramat Gan. The ones who insisted on staying uh, put uh, were later on uh, um, emerged uh, or, or later on sort of united into a city that is called Or Yehuda, which is until today populated mostly uh, by Iraqi Jews. Uh, there are Iraqi restaurants there. The Museum of Iraqi History uh, is located uh, in this uh, space. Um, and and uh, Or Yehuda has a very sort of uh, strange uh, policy in terms of naming street. One street is named after former Likud member or current Likud member and for, former Minister of Education, Gidon Saar. They have... Uh, a, um, a square named after Gabi Ashkenazi who was the chief of staff. Currently, the mayor called the street after his mistress, so that was a, a problem. But one of the interesting things is that a commercial center um, is still called Kfarana. So it's one of these cities where the, the name of the Palestinian village that was before uh, is still uh, there. Uh, the territories of Khairia were also divided. Uh, some of them now host the major zoo of Israel, the safari of Ramat Gan. In 2000-2005, the Dung Hill was finally evacuated and converted into a national park, which now hosts uh, concerts and ecological event. In 2007, the park was, uh, name was converted into the Ariel Sharon National Park. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I think, you know, I, I, I sort of uh, should have said this, that it's important to remember that um, in most cases, people don't belong, don't, are not born as, as refugees. They have a history before that is important. And, you know, it's important for the Iraqis, it's important for the Yemenites, for the Holocaust survivors, and it's important for the Syrians today. Oh, yeah. Also, my other question was, uh, the teacher that you was he no, no, he was Iraqi. All, the, all the most of uh, the cases that I've, uh, all the cases that I've described were pertinent to Iraqis. But the phenomena of living in these transit camps, um, I mean, there, there were mostly uh, Iraqis mostly went through these camps, but other Jews from Middle Eastern countries, um, as well as Jews from Europe, also lived in in these uh, in these refugee camps. So it was. Uh, it was an Iraqi phenomenon in the, in the sense that most Iraqis live through it, but it was not an Iraqi phenomenon in the case that they were unique. Um, I should say, though, that um, the experience with Iraqis um, later on uh, determined certain policies with respect to uh, other uh, individuals. So because the Iraqis didn't want to move to the Negev or to the south or to the north um, and, and said we will live in our tents and in our wooden shacks, but as long as we live in a place where we can find a livelihood, uh, the state later on decided that this is a, a very bad behavior. So when the North African came in the 60s and late 50s, they were immediately sent to the periphery. Uh, and, and some of them were even made to sign documents and saying we agree to work in agricultural labor so so that was uh, a, a sort of one wave kind of teaches the uh, the the administration teaches us uh, how to behave with the next wave. Yes. Oh, uh, thank you for the interesting talk um, what I was wondering is uh, since you talk about how the state deeds with the so-called black Jews uh, mm -hmm. Arab Jews parallel to that how does the discourse then uh, or the treatment of the Arab Israel, Arab Israel as well. The Arabs living on what was officially Israeli territory. How, I mean, similar was that? How related were the practices applied to Iraqis? The same or not the same? I was uh, just relating to the friend that was. Yeah, yeah, I figured. I figured. <laughs> Palestinians or Iraqis, but uh, the, th this is a great question. And so um, the Palestinians at the time were under a different regime, which was a military regime, uh, which severely curtailed uh, their, uh, their movement rights, uh, their rights to own labor. And some of the even sort of meager uh, uh, or some of the, these kind of the right to demonstrate that these poor Jews had was not uh, was not respected with respect to the uh, to the Palestinians. They could not demonstrate in Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem. 
Um, now, in, in terms of the relationship between the communities, the, the struggles are separated at times. But there's one space where the struggles are actually united, and that's the Israeli Communist Party. Um, Iraqi Jews join the Communist Party, they write in its journals. Emil Habibi, one of their chief uh, politicians and intellectuals, go to the transit goes to the transit camps, give, uh, give speeches. And so you have a very interesting moment where, um, you know, there's this kind of Arab-Jewish collaboration. On the other hand, the state was very, uh, and by the state I should say Mapai, uh, the governing body, was very, uh, the governing party, was very sinister in how it pitted one population against the other. Um, and so later on, and, um, you know, Iraqis were um, drafted, uh, or not drafted, but worked in intelligence units, uh, in security apparatus, and especially um, as teachers uh, in Palestinian schools, because they were safe, they weren't Nasserites, they, uh, they knew uh, um, Arabic uh, very well from Iraq. Um, and also the state used uh, Iraqi Jews and also Egyptian Jews in its propaganda uh, bureaucracy. So um, um, each, part, uh, each political party at the time had a newspaper in Arabic that was meant for what was called the Arab Israelis and for the new migrants. This was almost uh, exclusively an Iraqi venture with, uh, uh, with each party having uh, such a newspaper. Even Khirut, the, the mother of Likud uh, uh, that we enjoy today, um, had a, a newspaper called Al Huriya. Uh, that was written in Arabic by uh, Iraqi Jews. Uh, there were newspapers of the Histadrut. Um, Iraqis were also in the Histadrut Arab division. So it's a very interesting uh, way of creating hierarchies. So Esperance Cohen, whom I described, you know, not giving her babies away, later on she works in the in the Istadot with Arab women, and she writes about how she goes to, to educate the primitive Arab women and not uh, sort of uh, figuring out the, the irony there. Um, so, but on the other hand, we see also collaboration, you know, in terms of like uh, buying uh, groceries on, on sort of daily interaction between uh, these, uh, between uh, Middle Eastern migrants and Palestinians. So there's one case that I like where there's like, um, a group that smuggles things. I, I can't remember if it's from Jordan or from the north, but it's like a, a whole beautiful collaboration of Palestinians and Kurdish Jew and a Yemenite rabbi, I think, and they're all kind of working together. Uh, so that is also true. But I'm not sure about the details. So uh, I, I'm not making this up, but I need to check the details. <laughs> yes, Mada? I have two questions. So the first, thank you so much for such a rich historical ethnography. It's fascinating. I first I'd like to know what is your theoretical framework mm -hmm. so that this can be compared with other situations of migration and displacement in the global south. And then if the agency is so active as you describe it, why is the Mizrahi Ashkenazi gap continues to be so resilient? Why hasn't there been any change? And perhaps if I would like to offer a critique, uh, um, scholars in North America love to empower the little guy. Uh, compared, say, if you're looking, say, at analysis of Marta Mundi or Toby Kelly of, of, of these kind of issues in the Middle East. I mean, I'm talking from anthropologists who mm -hmm. do historical work. Um, how much of this emphasis on empowerment is stemming out of a certain intellectual trajectory that is prevalent in North America, always to look at the little guy and then feel good about the fact that the little guy was resisting. So I'll, I start with the, well, with the sort of intellectual uh, framework. Uh, as a historian, I'm, I'm very interested in, in transregional and transnational histories. Um, and so what I see as the migration of Middle Eastern Jews from Israel, to Israel, I see sort of as the tail end of the large migration waves, the, the, I mean, the talking about them as, as waves is, is so problematic, that start from Europe, then, uh, you know, after 1945, the creation of the State of Israel, the Nakba, the displacement of uh, Iraqi Jews. Now, 
the fact that it's global and transnational doesn't mean that there are not people to blame at every state of this migration, be it the Jewish agency, be it uh, uh, you know, the powers in Europe, uh, different uh, individuals, but I, I look at it as a sort of a comprehensive uh, history. Uh, in terms of um, you know, the, the kind of uh, uh, thinkers that informed, uh, um, or not the thinkers, but in terms of you know, how I wrote this, I actually wanted to uh, get out of you know, the, the great thinkers that write about migration, Said and Adorno, and the migrant as you know, a perpetual critic that stands out. I, want, I didn't want the intellectual. I wanted, as you said, uh, the little guy. And I think that the story of the little guy is important precisely because of the failure. Because when I am telling the stories of the little people, um, who were not little, they were kind of cool and big and great, but um, what I'm doing here is I think producing A, a counter history of the state, um, and B, um, I think that what I'm doing, I'm giving them a voice, but I'm not telling it as a, as you know, as a success story, they tried and they tried and then they succeed. No, they tried and they tried and they failed. But if we if we silence these voices, then uh, we end up with uh, the representation of the state. And at one point within Mizrahi studies, um, you know, I, I was a bit disappointed from this from the fact that you know, another study and another study. Uh, sort of deconstruct the Orientalism of the state. Yes, there were all these uh, uh, racist bureaucrats, but for me it was much more interesting to see the realities on the ground, how people interact with one another, uh, the bureaucrats that weren't racist, the collaboration between Ashkenazim and Mizrahim, despite much tension in these transit camps. So for me that was very uh, inspirational. And again, the, the thinking was to write a history that is not the history uh, of the state, that is not the history of a melting pot. And I think that what you do, what you get out of uh, this situation, what you get out of these, these kind of inquiries is a completely different Israel than the kind of the Israel that even today the liberal left likes to imagine, that everything went bad in 1967. But uh, before that, 48, 67, it was paradise. No, it was a, a country of migrants. Many of them were poor, many of them were struggling. The majority uh, uh, didn't even speak uh, Hebrew uh, as, a, as a mother tongue. And, and again, these kinds of things uh, informed my thinking. And especially in here, I think, um, it relates to um, another something that you can call theoretical intervention is the gendered aspect. We don't have studies about women in this period. Uh, and, you know, sometimes the first women that shows up in these studies is Angela Davis when the Black Panthers go and, and meet her. We need to, you know, describe, you know, uh, what happened uh, to, to migrant uh, women. Um, and there's work now about, you know, birth rates and, uh, and babies and, and, you know, simple things like buying milk. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it here. Yeah. So I have a question about language. Mm -hmm. Did the Iraqi Jews <coughs> try to keep Arabic, yeah. and then what happened with the second or third generation? Yeah, that's, thank you for this. This is um, very interesting. So um, if you look at the transit camps, you see uh, in the 50s and in the 60s, you see sort of three kinds of bilingualism. The older generation that speaks Arabic and can only maybe understand or speak uh, Hebrew. A second generation that is fluent in, in both, people who came when they were 17 or, or 18 or younger and a young generation that can speak Arabic but actually learns how to read and write in Hebrew and, um, and, uh, um, and, and is sometimes, as they grow up, even ashamed in the Arabic of their uh, parents. Uh, but in the 1950s, the Arabic was, uh, was very much alive in these camps. And there are a lot of complaints and newspaper accounts about the, these transit camps as exilic spaces, where you hear the language of the diaspora, Arabic, but also Yiddish and, and Ladino. Um, and, uh, but from these accounts and from these complaints, you see that you know, in the local cafe, uh, people listen to Radio Damascus and Radio Cairo. Um, that, uh, and, and you see the recognition of the significance of Arabic also in the electoral campaigns. 
all the parties that ran electoral campaigns in the transit camp, despite, you know, Hebrew ideology, Zionism, they all had, or many of them had translators and election rallies in Arabic because uh, they wanted uh, folks to vote. Um, and uh, even, you know, Menachem Begin has a translator and, uh, and, uh, and, and leaflets are written in, uh, in uh, Arabic. And that's why it was also important for each of these parties to have a newspaper in Arabic. Each political party, as I've mentioned, had a newspaper in Arabic for the Arab population of Israel, but also for these uh, Middle Eastern Jews to try to convince them uh, to vote for them, to ensure uh, voting. Mapai, the governing body, sort of said, okay, we bring them, they'll probably vote for us. And the elections were extremely corrupt uh, in these camps with pressure to vote uh, for Mapai. That was absolutely clear. But when people sort of resist the system, you see that Arabic pops up, and again, um, you see leaflets that were sort of circulated in the transit camp, one side Yiddish, one side Arabic. Um, I know from my work on Morocco that there's tremendous nostalgia mm -hmm. among Moroccan Jews and even they've articulated mm -hmm. to go back to Morocco. Yeah. Um, and you know, kind of some of these mm -hmm. rose classes, but I'm wondering, I mean, in general, people say Iraqis, you didn't feel like that, but I'm wondering if you, if you came across instances of them saying, we want to go back, it is better there, or, was, or did that, and did any go back, or was that or just yeah, so, so here, that, uh, thank you again. Uh, these are great questions. So there were um, Iraqi Jews, there were, uh, you know, reports about people wanting to come back, uh, to go back. But first, there was a state of war. And second, it was very difficult to get a passport, uh, almost impossible in certain cases. Um, and where would they migrate uh, to? Now, Iraq sort of uh, got to this uh, recognition that uh, uh, people need to go back only in the 1970s. And I have a, a wonderful colleague, Brian Roby, who just published a, a book on these demonstration in the, in the transit camps. And now uh, he's, and, and in Israel in general, um, and now he's doing a project on those who came back. And actually in Morocco, it was much more prominent because the king actually wanted that and more came back. Um, having said that, Iraq as a site of nostalgia uh, is definitely uh, there. Uh, people miss their homes, people miss their houses. Uh, there is a song in Arabic that says, uh, you know, that Iraq is used to sing. Uh, it's called Esh Sawetia Ben Gurion. What have you done, Ben Gurion? And it says, you know, we wished we rode donkeys here so we wouldn't get uh, uh, to this place. So Iraq, in a sense, became like a, a, a promised land for the, the first uh, generation. Um, and here, I think there is a, um, a difference from the, the Ashkenazi communities that, that you know, experienced the Holocaust. Um, for the Iraqis, that there was a sense that they could, that maybe they could go back. The famous case of sort of nostalgia to Iraq and also an actual attempt to go back is Samir Nakash, the writer who um, uh, continues writing in Arabic. And he tries to escape the border uh, to Lebanon and he's caught by the Lebanese authority with a cousin of his, and apparently they're very sympathetic to him, but they ship him back to Israel. Um, he's arrested in Tiberias, so he's then uh, released, but you know, he continued writing in the Iraqi dialect um, until he died about Iraq. Hi, um, thank you for your lecture. I have a couple questions. You said at one point that um, 1951 was this, it was this year in which it, um, Iraq labeled the, the thousands of Jews living there as uh, Zionist traitors, but you also said that Israel was eager to have them brought in. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering why, was it because of labor shortages? Why did they want to settle these Iraqi Jews only to have them you know, settled in yeah. these terrible transit camps? And, um, and you, you also mentioned austerities, and I have just a general question about who was placing austerities on Israel between this period of 1951 to 56. And I mean, you could point to that to account for the treatment of these Iraqi Jews, among other factors. But then, what? How do you explain the treatment of, for example, Ethiopian Jews today when Israel is no longer under such severe austerity measures? So. Um Thanks again. Uh, I'll, I'll start with um, uh, sort of the reasons that brought Iraqi Jews to Israel. So this is a very sort of 
complicated uh, story and I've, I've written about it, but essentially after 1948, during the war in 1948, Iraq uh, sort of declared a military regime um, and uh, um, it sort of wanted to combat Zionism. Uh, but in its uh, attempts to combat Zionism and making sure that every Jew is not a Zionist, they actually unleashed a very undemocratic campaign against the Jewish population of Iraq. 700 Jews were fired for government positions. Uh, uh, there was a crackdown on uh, Zionist and, and communist organizations that were equated together, although the, the communists were anti-Zionist. Uh, and um, there were arrests of people under the charges of Zionism. Some were indeed Zionists, other you know, were arrested because they wrote letters to relatives in uh, Israel or even in mandatory Palestine, or uh, they, uh, they bought property when Zionism was still legal in Iraq in the 1920s. So on the part of the state that singled out to Jews that you know, we're here second class citizens. Now Israel on the other hand in, uh, sort of uh, used it for its own propaganda campaigns and sort of said, you know, look how these Jews are persecuted. And at one point the, there is a recognition that they're in danger. Um, and there's a very interesting uh, dialogue between Shlomo Hillel, who was a chief Zionist there, and um, Levi Eshkol, and, and, uh, and uh, Eshkol tells him, you know, tell your Jews to come slowly, L don't let them rush, we don't have any place to put them. So there are these kind of uh, contradictory uh, discourses and practices where there's a lot of fear from these Jews because they're Arabs, because they're co like the Arabs, because they're communist, because they're not uh, Zionist, but on the other hand, an urgency to bring them to create a demographic balance with, uh, with the Palestinians. That was a, a major concern. That's why also under these severe conditions of poverty, uh, people were still encouraged to have many children. Um, and so these are very complicated um, realities and of course after the, the Jews lose their property because the Iraqi state uh, passes a law that uh, uh, na uh, freezes all their assets, um, Israel doesn't want to deal with it directly and it's actually become connected to the question of Palestinian property. Um, and my colleague Yudha Shanhav has even suggested that uh, sort of the thinking that if the Iraqi lose their property and the Palestinian lose their property uh, was something that motivated people even before the law was actually legislated. Now, the situation of poverty um, is extremely important because, um, and the state lack of uh, measures to support uh, the Jews. Um, so basically, if, if I remember I gave this talk in a, a different talk, but in, in, a, in, a, in an event where um, the, uh, the Israeli consul was, was there. This is recorded, but I, never mind, I'll tell you. So uh, he immediately raised his hand and said, you know, this is a country that just emerged from uh, the 48th war. 1% of the population was killed. Uh, there were no funds, especially before the repatriation from Germany came. So the state was poor. It was bankrupt. So mistakes were made. These are mistakes. This is not part of a well-orchestrated plan. Um, and again, what I'm trying to show is that, you know, some of, the, of these conditions, blaming people for their poverty created by the state, uh, the callousness, the, the cruelty, uh, the idea that folks are human material that needs, to be vo that needs to vote for the right party, this is not just conditions of poverty, that there's something uh, else uh, at stake here. Uh, as for the austerity measures, so those were imposed on Israel by Israel itself because the country was poor. Um, and the, ra the ratios of uh, what a family should eat were actually devised by an American uh, specialist, I think. Um, and, um, and later on this was implemented. Now this idea of food measures and how people get food and buy food, and again there has been work on that by other scholars, is a prominent thing uh, in Israel of the 1950s. When people took buses, there were inspectors going on buses making sure that people didn't hide eggs or chickens or things like that uh, that they bought uh, at, the, at the black market. Um, and, and actually the, the ratios and the austerity measures, these were political Political issues. The general Zionist, another party, talked about them. Um, it was uh, how the Hebrew housewife deal with this situation. This was something that was important. Now, again, for um, the folks in the transit camps, they didn't even get milk. They got milk powder. Uh, so you know, so that was um, that was an issue. 
Now, the question with the Ethiopian Jews, I think, is extremely important because, again, it shows that it wasn't just a question uh, of lack of resources, that there are issues here of race and color uh, and who belongs to the, the right race and who doesn't belong to the right race. What's interesting, though, is that uh, these, these uh, um, sort of demonstrations and protests are actually um, um, sometimes autonomous. So when the Ethiopians uh, demonstrated uh, about less than a year ago in the streets of Tel Aviv, sort of huge wave of, of urban riots, you know, the signs were not as, were not, not all signs were about solidarity with other groups. The, the signs actually spoke about Ferguson and Baltimore. Mm -hmm. So it's also transnational in this way. I just had a question about remittances during that time. So I mean, I was just thinking about these Iraqi Jews and I was thinking about the Ashkenaz Jews. And I am perhaps I'm really thinking that there were a lot of American Jews who were sending money to people that they thought were relatives mm -hmm. in Israel. Do you, and so, so even though there was austerity member measures, the Ashkenazi Jews might have been getting. Yeah, so, so the stay, I mean, the Ashkenazi Jews uh, got better off when, when money starts coming from Germany. That's, uh, that's an important uh, project. Uh, but I think the, in, another sort of significant uh, issue is that there were a lot of donations from the United States. And actually, Israel didn't want to get uh, um, donations from the United Nations or any organization like that, because in its mentality or in its perception, these were not refugees. These were sons returning to the motherland. Um, and um, so what you have, though, is like there's, um, there's no money. And so the idea is every time that there is no money, we will go to the brothers and sisters in the United States and ask for money. Uh, it's called, uh, the, the term in, in many cases is called magbit. Golda Meir was sent on many of these missions. She was thought to be, you know, a, a hit. Uh, but um, you also see in, in the accounts that after, so 48, you get a lot of money. 49, you get a lot of money. Um, and actually, the, the transit camps, and I have to say there is a, lo there is a lot more materials at the joint archives that I haven't looked at, uh, but you also see it in materials, you know, the transit camps and the sufferings of, of everybody and sort of orientalized images of Yemeni Jews, they figure prominently in, in kind of asking donations from the United States. But you also have a sort of decline in the number of donations coming from the United States. After 49, uh, people are like, well, you know, you wanted the state, you want to, you know, deal with it. Um, and also in 1956, that's the war in Korea. So then it really plumps. So, so there were donations all the time. And, and actually in official discourse, you also see like, why aren't the American Jews giving us more? Uh, so the perception of you know, American Jews as kind of the, the cash box and we'll go and we'll have this fundraising and the good brothers and sisters will give, it's always less than what people uh, anticipate. But maybe that's the nature of uh, so, fundraising. So, so I, I got that and, and I, I, that was what I expected. But the one-on-one -on -one giving, so I don't, I don't think so. I think that, uh, that the donations were, from what I know, were delivered uh, by uh, the state. I mean, you do have, you know, kind of in autobiographies, you know, of Ashkenazi Jews, like, you know, the uncle from America or the aunt from America who send a package or who shows up or, or helps. So those family relationships, uh, definitely. Well, thank, thank you very much. You.